Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin wassalatu wassalamu ala asyrafil anbiya'i wal mursalin sayyidina Muhammadin sallallahu alaihi wasallam wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa man tabi'ahum bi ihsanin ila yawmiddin amma ba'd. Brothers and sisters, jazakumullahu khairan for your attendance to this um, final session on Ayat al-Kursi. And we've tried our best not to go deeper and deeper into this ayah, but we are unable to because it's an immersive ayah. And every phrase in this ayah has taken us so deep. And I'd like to tell you that thus far, just on Ayat al-Kursi, the presentations we've had, we've pretty much gone over 130 slides on Ayat al-Kursi. That's how magnificent this ayah is and it deserves the title of being the greatest ayah of Al-Qur'an. So now we're down to the last portion of it that talks about the omnipotence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which also leads to other aspects about his greatness. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the punchline in the ayah, it's called Ayat al kursi to give us a rational understanding of something that we could not rationalize. So Allah is giving us a way to rationalize the infinite, the omnipotent, the magnificent, the supreme. Human beings are unable to do so. So Allah is bringing it down to our level. Allahu Akbar. For us to enjoy this last piece of it, let's start with our warm up. Inshallah, you are unable to, you are able to unmute yourselves and let us get straight into the warm up. I revised it to add an additional question. So let's get to it, inshallah. Bismillah rahman rahim Question number one, what did Allah do right after creating the heavens and the earth? It's a statement that Allah makes in Quran in many, many places. What did Allah do right after finishing the creation of the heavens and the earth? As he himself states. You can type your answer in the chat or you may unmute yourself and give a response. Anyone? Is it watch, watch what he has done? You're getting close to, he did something that Allah always says in the Quran. So he somebody, up, bro. Yeah, so two back. people concur on that. One person typed it in. Allah makes the istiwa over the arsh. And we're going to get deeper into um, not so much as the arsh, but why does Allah say arsh most of the time in the Quran and not so much the very kursi that this ayah is all about? In fact, brothers and sisters, this is a very interesting piece of nugget for you. In the entire Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions his kursi once and once only and it's in ayat al kursi but we're gonna get other questions similar number two allah states that he has a kursi and an arsh then what is the difference between arsh and kursi linguistically we can't really understand everything allah has created we haven't seen it but why does allah mention that he has an arsh and also a kursi what's the difference did anybody find a difference between them? Some translations mistranslate them to be the same thing, but they are not the, the same thing. What's the difference between Arsh and Kursi? Did anyone find that piece of information? Is is Kursi is right in front of the chair? Like if you go back to your picture, like there's uh, where you put your foot. Exactly. So I'm glad somebody noticed that. Arsh, linguistically, is a throne, as a king would have, or a queen. A kursi is something much smaller, like a footstool. Like a footstool. Although today, contemporary Arabia, contemporary Arabic, they say kursi to mean a chair. But it isn't actually a chair. It is a footstool. And translators, many of them have made this mistake. There's a huge difference between an arsh and a kursi. Yes, today's chairs are not thrones. So it, it makes some sense that maybe modern day chairs, they're much smaller. You put your butt on it. 
but a kursi technically you put your foot on it wrong okay so it's wrong yeah so that's what i'm saying translators mistranslated kursi to mean throne arsh means throne kursi yeah. means footstool so we're gonna get we're gonna we're gonna see something very interesting about that and somebody alluded to the picture so i use that image to uh, make you draw the inference we're gonna get to some very interesting parts about why does allah have uh, mentioned arsh kursi and what's the, why the kursi in this ayah to to demonstrate his greatness number three what surahs begin with the Arsh of Allah? Were you able to find a surah in the beginning, let's say first couple of ayat, did you find the Arsh of Allah mentioned? Because again, Kursi is only mentioned few times in Quran. Actually mentioned twice, one for Allah, but one for something, someone else. That's a question we're gonna deal with. But you find the Arsh of Allah is mentioned all over the Quran. So let's go a couple of surahs that have in the beginning, Arsh throw who found one so somebody says suratul baqarah in the beginning of suratul baqarah i don't see a mention of the harsh in the like like in the first five ayat so somebody typed in surat arad he said surat arad ayat number two alif la mim ra and then what follows So that person got what? Arad. Ayah number two. Allahu alladhi rafa'a samawati bighayri amadin tarawnaha thumma stawa ala al-arsh. So somebody typed in Surat Ali Amrad. Allah la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyu al-qayyum nazzala alayka al-kitaba bil-haqq musaddiqan lima bayna yadayh wa anzala at-tawrata wal-injil but the harsh is not mentioned yet in that early parts of Ali Imran so at rad has it mentioned there so that's one did anyone else find another surah that mentions the throne of Allah so somebody typed surah Yunus jazakallahu khairan and in that similar context, in Narabakmullahu Ladi Khalaka Sama Wati Wal Ordna Fisi Tati Ayamin Thum Mastawa Alala Arshi Yuda Birul Am Bamin Shafi M Min Badi Idni Dalikumullahu Rabbukum Fabudu Afala Tadakaru. So yes, yeah, see, so Allah mentions his arsh many times in the context of after I created, meaning he states, after creating the heavens and the earth, he makes the istiwa. Very good. So we'll take those few and I'll show you some, some more even later. So that's good. See, now you're paying attention when you read Quran, you see the reference, then you understand this meaning of Arsh. Let me make this point. There are some Muslims who have a problem with the literal understanding of words in the Quran. So such Muslims, may Allah guide them, they refuse to accept that Arsh means a throne. They say that it means something else. Arsh represents the power of Allah. Well, Allah clearly talks about his own power in Quran by saying quwa, which would mean like strength or power, qudra, you know. So Allah uses the real term for power and strength and might already. So Arsh cannot mean that figuratively. Allah says he always makes this istiwa ala al-Arsh. Accept the Quran for what it says, the how we don't necessarily know. Day of judgment, we'll see it because Allah says angels even do this. So Brothers and sisters, stay away from anybody who tries to negate the meaning of what Allah is, says, the literal meaning of what Allah says, something is, especially about himself. It's not in our position to say, well, when he said that, it doesn't mean that. We don't have wahi to say it doesn't mean that. And the Prophet ﷺ did not tell us that it means anything else. In fact, the Prophet ﷺ has mentioned many times the Arsh of Allah shook that Musa was grasping onto some of the columns of the Arsh of Allah. Now, somebody raised his hand that may have had a question. I think is Brother Muhammad. Go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Oh, perhaps it was a mistake. Okay, so we'll get more suar that have Arsh mentioned in the beginning. Number four, it's got to get interesting. Suratul Haqqah. So 
Quran number 69. How many angels carry this arsh of Allah? Allah says. And this, this is why I made that point because they misguided Muslims who reject what Allah says about himself. And that means they reject other ayat. And this is a sign of kufr, which some of it could be really bad for a person when they could disbelieve, they could reject the wrong thing and that puts them in hellfire or in the wrong side of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Suratul Haqqa, Allah says I have a arsh and Allah says it is carried, day of judgment. How many angels did Allah say carries this arsh yawm al qiyamah? Jazakumullah khairan. Two people concurred on that. Eight. Wa yahmilu arsha rabbika fawqahum yawma idhin thamaniyah. Yawma idhin tu'radhuna la takhfa minkum khafi. Allah says this is the day you return back to me and Allah comes majestically like the supreme sovereign. Allah claims that day. Maliki yawm idhin. He comes like the king of kings and the lord of lords. So do not reject the aqidah of Allah's arsh. He said, I have a throne and just carry it. And Allah mentions it many times in the Quran. And that's why question number three is important because Surah Ghafir mentions this arsh in the beginning of it as well. And some of you may have seen that. Number five, in Surah Ghafir, Surah number 40, what are the angels doing around the arsh of Allah's manata? That was a giveaway for people who did not see that in number three, that's number five was a giveaway. What are the angels doing around this arsh of Allah? It's very important to you and I, by the way. The angels do something mm -hmm. around the house. They're doing so very. So somebody typed in there, making dua, jazakillah khairan. Yes. They go around the house. They make actually tawaf around the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa ta'ala al-malaika ta'hafina min hawli al-arsh. They, they praise and glorify Allah. You said, Bihuna bihamdi rabbihim. So in Surah Ghafir, Allah says, um, you know, الذين يحملون العرش ومن حوله يسبحون بحمد ربهم ويؤمنون به ويستغفرون للذين آمنوا. They make istighfar for you and I. Beautiful dua. We'll we'll take that dua later at, at some point in time. Imagine the angels. Allah gave a voice to angels in Quran. Allah is the speaker of Quran, so Allah reveals to what the angels are saying. This is beautiful, brothers and sisters. It goes to show you the connection between man and angel. They make this dua. ربنا وَسِعْتَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ رَحْمَةً وَعِلْمًا فَاغْفِرْ لِلَّذِينَ تَابُوا وَاتَّبَعُوا سَبِيلَكَ وَقِهِمْ عَذَابَ الْجَحِيمِ They make dua for you and your parents and your spouse and your children. رَبَّنَا وَأَدْخِلْهُمْ جَنَّاتِ عَدْنٍ الَّتِي وَعَدْتَهُمْ وَمَنْ صَلَحَ مِنْ آبَائِهِمْ وَأَزْوَاجِهِمْ وَذُرِّيَاتِهِمْ إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْعَزِيزُ Angels pray for you. If you become a kafir, angels despise you. And the dua of angels, malaika, always accepted. So if you and I believe in Allah, and they, they're making dua for those who what? Make istighfar and tawbah. If you keep on making istighfar and tawbah, angels will pray for you. Allah will accept their, in, their, their dua, and you will be saved from hellfire by the will of and by the rahmah of Allah. Beautiful. Number six, in Surah to Tawbah, what dua of trust in Allah mentions his arsh? There's a beautiful dua you have to make when you really put your trust in Allah. When the world turns its back on you, you show that you trust and rely only upon Allah. That dua includes the arsh of Allah. What is that dua? Surah to Tawbah. It's a very common dua you make. You don't even know it came from Surah to Tawbah. You think Surah to Tawbah is about the sword, about jihad. No, Surah Tawbah is about Tawbah, forgiveness. It's in the end of a Tawbah. Allahu Akbar, somebody got that. Jazakallah khairan. فَإِن تَوَلَّوْا فَقُلْ حَسْبِيَ اللَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوَ عَلَيْهِ تَوَكَّلْتُ وَهُوَ رَبُّ الْعَرْشِ الْعَظِيمِ That, when you say حَسْبِيَ اللَّهُ وَنِعْمَ الْوَكِيدِ This is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us from Surah Tawbah. And it's actually, it was a dua that Allah gave the Prophet Sallallahu said, if the people turn away from you, no problem. Say, has be Allah. Allah is sufficient for me. Brothers and sisters, when somebody wrongs you and you don't have the power to exact revenge, say, has be Allah. La ilaha illahu alayhi tawakkalt wa huwa rabbul arshil azim. And Allah will deal with that person for you. Not immediately. At the best time. To Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.
do that anytime somebody takes your right, somebody tries to abuse you, and you have no ability to claim your right or defend yourself. You say has to be Allah. Whether it's an employer, a co-worker, or a neighbor, has to be Allah. But you should say the full thing. Has be Allah who la ilaha illahu alayhi tawakkalt wa huwa rabbul arshil azim. You call on that throne and the throne of Allah shakes sometimes. If you call him crying so, so, so much, so badly, sometimes a believer dies like Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad. You know, one of the great Sahabi of Prophet when he passed away, Subhan the Prophet said, Allah's heart shook for this guy. He's the one who was the arbiter between the Muslim, the believers, and Bani Quraidah. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said 70,000 angels wanted to attend his janazah. That's how much he meant to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. When people wrong you very badly, our brothers and sisters in Iraq, in Syria, in, in China, in the area called Xinjiang, if they say to Allah, Hasbi Allah, La ilaha illahu, alayhi tawakkalt, wa huwa rabbul arshil azim, Allah will smite all their enemies almost instantaneously, if they do it enough. So remember that. Very powerful dua. End of Surah Tawbah. Number seven. In Surah Saad, Surah number 36, who also has a kursi? Allah has a kursi, but somebody else has a kursi. Allah tells us. That's the beauty of the Quran. It's another majestic person. Another person that is so majestic in his... Um, kingship that Allah gave him what he didn't give anybody else in authority in this dunya. Prophet Mulk Sulaiman? Yes, Prophet Sulaiman alayhi salam has a kursi. Did you notice that? MashaAllah. And I'm going to ask another question about that. So Sulaiman alayhi salam has a kursi. Not only a kursi, he had like the biggest kingdom on earth, so to speak, because he made dua for it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when, when, when Sulaiman made his request to Allah, he says, Rabbi habli mulkan la yambaghi li ahadin min ba'di. Oh Allah, give me a kingdom or a dominion on earth that no one else will have after me. Grant you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could give Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam anything he wanted if he asked for it. I'll tell you a very interesting thing. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, this hadith, one time he was making salah and a jinn came to distract him. Subhanallah, while in salah. And the Prophet said something about, against this jinn. The companions heard that and as if he wanted to grab him with by his hand. So, so the, Prophet, the companions were confused, what's happening? The Prophet told him after he said, there was a jinn here trying to disturb me, so I, I grabbed him. And I was going to tie him on a pillar in the masjid so the kids can play with it. But I decided to let it go. Because of Sulaiman's dua, I didn't want to take control of the jinn here because he made this dua. Prophet is showing respect to dua of another Nabi, saying, you know, I'll, I'll let him have that. Allahu Akbar. It's amazing, isn't it? Subhanallah. Mm -hmm. That's what Saad. So uh, in Surah An-Naml, Surah number 27, who also has that arsh? Allah tells us that other people have arsh in this dunya, you know. Royal people, we're going to know, but one of them Allah mentioned in Surah An Naml. Who has an Arsh in Surah An Naml? Obviously, Sulaiman will have an Arsh too, by inference. He has a Kursi. You have to have an Arsh to go with the Kursi. But put that aside. Who else has an Arsh that was mentioned in Surah An Naml? No. Yes, so somebody type there the Queen. Of Saba. Yes, Allah says she had this is how it was reported by the spy, the scout, I would say. Scout. Imagine a woman, a queen, a, you know, a, a sovereign. So, you know, I would say it's so regal that she had an impressive throne that Sulaiman wanted to know. <laughs> And Suleiman wanted it brought over to him. That's how the scout said. So that's pretty interesting. When we get to Atanama, we have to talk about the dynamic between Suleiman and the Queen of Saba. They named her Bilqis. 
Now, very good. So, so no, question number nine. Which sajda of recitation mentions the arsh of Allah? There are many sajda in the Quran. About 15 places of sajda, sajda of recitation. When you, reach a, you read an ayah and then they put a mark for you to make sajda because the Prophet ﷺ made a sajda in this point. It is sunnah to make sajda. It's not a requirement, but it's good to do. But in one of them, it mentions the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that answer is very close to the previous questions. Mm. Anyone else? So somebody type short to Namal Ayah number 26. And that ayah is from the ayat of the scout. I'm not going to name the scout because there's a question about it. Who came later on said that I saw them, these people making such mm -hmm. that to the sun, except of, uh, you know, besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that and shaitan has deluded them in what it is they're doing. Yes. And then Allah, Allah yasjudu lillahi alladhi yukhriju al-khab'a fi s-samawait wal-ard. Wa ya'lamu ma, you know, tukfuna wa ma tu'alinun. Allahu la ilaha illa huwa rabbul arsh al-azim. Then he makes sajda. Allah wa akbar. Surat al-Namal. Namal. Very good. By the queen of Saba. That, when that story starts. All right, number 10. How did Prophet Sulaiman learn about this other arsh? Specifically, his told him. He... Say that mm -hmm. again. His hudhud told him. Yes, a bird, one of his soldiers, scouts, okay. the hudhud, told him. Well, so it, it, very interesting. I'm glad you said that. Can you imagine Sulaiman? Allah gave him like superhuman powers. Things we think that superheroes will have, like, you know how Superman has super hearing? He can see far, blah, blah, blah. Imagine Sulaiman, alayhi salam, assembles his army. Allah says, وَحُشِرَ لِسُلَيْمَانَ جُنُودُهُ مِنَ الْجِنِّ وَالْإِنسِ وَالْطَيْنِ His army oh, comprised yeah. of jinn, human yeah. beings, and yeah. birds. Birds and ants. And Allah. So, listen to this very carefully. It's pretty interesting. Imagine if you had tens, hundreds of thousands of human beings and devils, well, not all things, but you get the idea, jinn and birds. I mean, it could be a multitude of them assembled and Sulaiman noticed one of them is missing. He said, Ma la ara al -hud -hud. Min al He says, how come I don't see the hood hood? Is he absent? So that means that that bird is not just any bird. This bird was probably be a scout or one of his favorite birds. He said, Law adzibanna. He says, SubhanAllah. We will punish him. Or we're going to slaughter him. Or he's going to give me a good excuse. <laughs> so the hood, hood came. And Allah says, Famakata ghayra ba'id. So he came not too far. And then he says, Ahattu bima lam to hit I bring you information which I happened upon, which you do not know. I came all the way from Saba with certain news. I found that a woman is in charge of them. And she has everything. And she has a great heart that picked the interest of Sulaiman. Yes, you do not shamsi So that's how he learned about it. The hood hood, the hoopo bird told him. And he was probably one of his soldier scouts. Number eleven. Which prophet's parents were raised on a throne on an arsh? A prophet's parents was raised on an arsh. Who knows who that prophet? Musa? Ah, Musa doesn't know much about his father, just his mother, but she was not raised in Hajj. But you're getting very warm because it happened in the same place Musa was. You're getting very warm. Yusuf? Yusuf alayhi salam's parents. Abati, 
after all the toilets and trouble of Yusuf in Egypt, finally his his family came back after the drought. They came, they got food. He got reunited with his brother, Bin Yamin, and the rest of them. They raised his parents on the throne. And then the people made sajda to him. And then they told his father. Who was the father of Yusuf, by the way, folks? Who was the father of Yusuf? Yaqub. Yaqub, and he happens Yaqub. to be also another prophet. Yaqub is a Nebi. And then he told him, remember the dream of Yusuf? I saw 11 stars, the sun and the moon made sajda. That was his mother, father, and his 11 brothers. It turned out to be Allahu Akbar. Number 12, what happened to Sulaiman's kursi? From what you read in Surat Saad, what happened to his kursi? It almost may be like the insurrection of January 6th. <laughs> Imagine that. He faced a minor insurrection. Mm -hmm. What happened to Prophet Suleiman's kursi according to Surat Saad? He got destroyed? Something similar happened to him. Somebody typed, he temporarily lost it when a jinni, they call it jasada, took over it. After that incident, he made that word for Allah to give him the most powerful kingdom. He almost got overthrown by a jinn. Imagine that. So Allah gave him control of the jinn. So, so much so that he pictured his brothers and sisters. Imagine Allah gave Sulaiman so much power that Allah subjugated the jinn to him. And Allah said, if any jinn does not respond to his command, Allah punished that jinn. The jinn were so afraid of Sulaiman, he stood in his chambers with a staff in his hand, looking at them as they built stuff. Allah said, Sulaiman died. He died while standing there. The jinn did not know. Until some type of worm or insect ate the staff until it, it fell down. It fell down. That's when they realized he was dead a long time and they were just working. Subhanallah. And Allah, you know what Allah said? If the jinn knew the unseen, they would have known he died a long time ago. Subhanallah. The jinn do not know the future, brothers and sisters, but they sometimes listen to malaika talk about events. Malaika, mm. they, they saw malaika read from a lawhi mahfud, and they talk about events to, that will happen because they, you know, and that's how the jinn eavesdrop. That's why Allah shoot them down. Imagine that. Powerful Prophet Sulaiman. Number mm -hmm. 13. Which surahs end with the harsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Were you able to find any? There are a few of them that mention. So somebody taps what? An Nasr. إذا جاء نصر الله والفتح ورأيت الناس يدخلون في دين الله أفواجا فسبح بحمد ربك واستغفر إنه كان توابا. That does not include the harsh explicitly. I want one that include the harsh explicitly. We already gave you one in a previous question. A tawbah ends with the harsh of Allah because of that dua. ورب العرش لي جزاك الله خيرا for getting a tawbah. Ah. So some of these questions answer themselves. So perfect. We have sort of tawbah. We also have other surahs that mention it towards Surat Az Zumar. Yes, Jazakilaw Khairat. Surat Az Zumar, we mentioned that already. Watar al Malay ikata hafina min awli al arsh. You said bihuna bihamdi rabbihim. Wa kudya bayna hum bil haq wa qil al hamdu so going around the arsh. That's very, very good, mashallah. So we have Az Zumar. And then there are a few more we'll, I, will, I, will show, I will share with you again as well. So we have a Tawbah, and we have Surat Az-Zumar, and also Surat Al-Mu'minun towards the earth. فَتَعَالَ اللَّهُ الْمَلِكُ الْحَقِّ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوَ رَبُّ الْعَرْشِ الْكَرِيمِ 
Okay. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Um, number 14. This one I added uh, recently. What are the most common statements Muslims make to invoke the greatness, the might and power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What common statements we make that are referencing Allah? So somebody types Allahu Akbar. Akbar, yes. That's very good, yes. Allahu Akbar Allah is one Akbar. of the most common statements we make. MashaAllah. There's another one. Sometimes it's like in the form of a dua. We do it all the time. You just don't realize it. You see? So anyone remember? It's a very common statement that, if, that calls upon the power of Allah, the strength and might. Somebody says, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Yes. Jazakillah khairan. MashaAllah. That's very good. All right. So let's take number 15. There's another statement, but I'll put it for you guys later. Number 15. Who are the seven that are, are allowed under the, the shade of the Arsh of Allah? For those Muslims who don't believe the Arsh of Allah is a physical thing, well, there's a hadith that says that that Arsh will cast a shadow. Yawm al -qiyama, when everybody's surrounded by the sun, only seven categories of people enter the shade. According to this hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, seven, that, so just give me one of them. Somebody says, a man whose heart is attached to magic. Very good, yes. Say that again. They were not specifically mentioned, but because they fall in the other categories, but they know what no, they get. They, they're even better. They're in Jannah, by the way. <laughs> they just come out after the horn is blown. They were enjoying themselves in Jannah. Very good, by the way. Who else? Um, who is the most consequential person in society? So somebody says, Youth who grew up with Wishbullah. Nasha fi ibadatillah. Yes, youth that grow up worshiping Allah, brothers and sisters. If your kids grow up playing Fortnite and video games and PlayStation and Xboxes, they could be denied entrance into this house. So if I were you, I'll be extremely strict with them with this stuff. But unfortunately, youth and playfulness go like bread and butter. That is why serious youth have a special status. Somebody says a just ruler. The most consequential person in society is the ruler. Ruler can make one decree and it will harm you and your entire family. It will hurt and kill people. The leader, the former leader of the United States, consequential inaction led to the deaths of nearly 500,000 people. Do you understand how bad a, a, a ruler could be or how good they could be? That's why the first one mentioned by the Prophet Sallallahu is Imamun Adil. Imamun Adil doesn't mean an imam that leads Salah. In Quranic context, imam is the leader of the people. So Fir'aun is imam. There could be good imams and bad imams, not in the context of Salah. We just call the one who leads Salah imam as well. So the leader of the, of the people is called imam, a just ruler gets to enter the shade because a ruler with justice brings benefit to the people. Allah knows the hearts of everyone, but I'm going to make this worldly comparison. Take a look at two different leaders for the similar situation. A terror attack happened in New Zealand. How did the New Zealand ruler react to that versus a terror attack happens in, say, France? It so happens that New Zealand's prime minister is a woman, right? She was so shocked by what happened. She banned guns. She attended the janaza of the Muslims and she paid for even some of the janaza. Rallied the people around to say, this is wrong. We're going to stamp it out. What happens in France is like, oh, when something happens to the Muslims, nobody cares. And then something happens, oh, let's round up all the Muslims. Let's lock all the masajid in. Very poor. This is the difference between, you know, allow. Like, Allah guide whoever he wants. Just to give an example of how a ruler makes the difference. So somebody puts there after just ruler, a man, a person that gives. But let's explain how that person gives. The Prophet said, وَرَجُلٌ تَصَدَّقَ بِصَدَقَ فَأَخْفَاهَا And he keeps it so secret, حَتَّى لَا تَعْلَمْ شِمَالُهُ مَا أَنْفَقَتْ يَمِينُ You give so secretly that your left hand doesn't know what your right hand has given. And that is figurative speaking, that to say, you're so secretive in giving, 
Nobody knows you're the giver. Even the person who receives it thinks you probably need it. They don't even know you give. Subhanallah. And Allah praises in Quran. Allah says, whatever you give, Allah knows it. Allah says, in tubdu sadaqati fa So if you disclose your sadaqah, like when the masjid is trying to raise funds, you disclose, that's fine. Allah says, wa in tukfuha wa tuha al-fuqara fa huwa khayrun lakum wa yukafiru ankum min sayyatikum. Allah says, if you, if you keep it quiet, you don't disclose it, but you just get it done, Allah says that's even better for you because it helps your sincerity and keeps you away from showing off. But it is good to sh um, to, to do things publicly, you know, as, as an example for others. So that is one. And then somebody typed there, وَرَجُلٌ ذَكَرَ اللَّهَ خَالِيَا فَفَعَضَتْ عَيْنَا Somebody who remembers Allah in private and they weep and become tearful. Let me tell you why that is important. Brothers and sisters, when we're in the jama'a salah, when we pray in congregation, when one person starts crying, it sometimes influences others to start crying because they, they feel the same sorrow effect. So that is the type of crying that is, in essence, evoked by somebody else. It is triggered by somebody else. Imagine you are alone by yourself in your room. You pray to Allah and you wept for your own sins. You wept because of the greatness of Allah. Allah says, you deserve to enter that shame. To remember Allah in private without hearing someone else crying around you that will evoke sorrow in you, but by yourself. You see, this is why it's a higher quality. Giving in secret so that way the people who receive it don't even know you're the giver. It's a higher step. A ruler who can kill people who has so much power. They even go so much and say that the US president is the most powerful person on the planet. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. They nearly died from Corona. But that's what they call that leader. So that leader can harm a lot of people. How many people died in Iraq for a false war? That's why when the leader restrained themselves, they act mercifully. They act with justice. They deserve to be under the shade. A person that loves the masjid for the sake of Allah. The masjid is a, it's not a fun place. It's a place to be serious. To love it when if you leave it, you feel, you feel sad. You want to come back. You deserve to be there. What about two people who love each other for the sake of Allah? Two people who love each other for the sake of Allah. Just purely for the sake of Allah. Because of money. You know how many people come around the, the, uh, the uh, ex-president just because they think they can benefit from him, they can get money from him? They pretty much assume that and they know clearly that he may be stupid, easily influenced, whatever it is. Behind his back, they call him, you know, an effing moron, as you know, it was reported by even a one of the cabinet members in Islam. Brothers and sisters, all of you in this call, I don't know many of you personally, but I can say, Walillah alhamd, I love you all for the sake of Allah. It's not because you give me any money. It's not <laughs> of anything. But this is what I'm saying. Islam teaches us a new thing. To have this brotherhood, loving somebody purely for the sake of Allah, not because of any worldly benefit and not because of a family relationship. Yes, it's easy to love people who are your family members, but not people you don't know at all, but just because they are mu'min. Subhanallah. So remember, Imam Adil, وَرَجُلٌ قَلْبُهُمْ مُعَلَّكٌ بِالْمَسَاجِدِ وَشَابٌ نَشَأَ فِي عِبَادَةِ اللَّهِ وَرَجُلَانِ تَحَابَّا فِي اللَّهِ اجْتَمَعَ عَلَيْهِ وَتَفَرَّقَ عَلَيْهِ وَرَجُلٌ تَصَدَّقَ بِصَدَقَ فَأَخْفَاهَا حَتَّى لَا تَعْلَمْ شِمَالُهُ مَا يَنْفَقَتْ يَمِينُهُ And you forgot one which is based on the Me Too movement. وَرَجُلٌ دَعَتْهُمْ رَأَةٌ ذَاتَ مَعْصِبٍ وَجَبْعَالٍ فَقَالَ إِنِّي أَخَافُ اللَّهِ A man who is seduced by a beautiful, prestigious, and powerful woman. He resists the temptation. He says, I fear Allah. Can anybody give us a very important example of that? A man who resisted a powerful and rich, influential woman. Yusuf. Yusuf. Yusuf yes, Yusuf is the epitome of that. See? And then a person, number seven, a person who remembers Allah in secret. Jazakumullah khairan. This is wonderful, excellent answers. And we're just getting warmed up about the harsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, so these are the answers. Right after creation, Allah made istiwa ala al-arsh. How the istiwa works, we don't know. 
Allah says I do it, he did it. And that's why the ulama of Ahlul Sunnah, jama'ah, they would make this style of statement. Al-istiwa'u ma'loom. Istiwa, the word, we know what it means. It means to rise over something. Well, kayfiyati majhul. The how Allah does it is undefined. Well, imanu bihi wajib. But believing that Allah does that is wajib because Allah says, tum mastawalash. Wasu'alu anhu bid'ah. But to ask about how we did it is bid'ah. So don't ask, well, how come Allah does it? Does it mean he have it? He says, tum mastawalash. Does istiwa mean that is, it doesn't mean anything else? Allah says it is just like you accept it, you say, subhanallah. Just remember, Allah is not like anything you know. It's not like a human being sitting on a throne. But it's everything Allah does befits his majesty. That is why we will only know the true ta'wil of it, the interpretation of it, when you see him, Yawm Al-Qiyamah. And guess what? Some people will never see their Lord ever, ever. That's why Allah SWT says, Surah Al-Mutafifin. Allah hates some people so much that Allah will not even show himself to them. Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Some people are such disbelievers that when Allah says there's a shin to Allah, when they call people to make sajda, they cannot make sajda. Allah will cause their entire vertebra, their, 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 their back, the bones in their back, their vertebra, all of it to become like one bone and they cannot bend it. Allah says, don't make, if you didn't make ruku to me and sajda at dunya, Allah says, I don't need for you to make it. Subhanallah. So you have to accept Allah the way he describes himself. Don't try to rationalize it too much. Difference between Arsh and Kursi. Al-Arsh is a throne, a real throne. I mean, a throne, like the very, very large thing which a, a sovereign will sit. And a footstool is somewhere a sovereign might put their foot or that smaller chair. Like some of you have a futon at home, something you can rest, you recline your foot to your couch. That's the example of a Kursi. And Allahu A'lam, how Allah makes his, but you're going to learn something beautiful about that. Surahs that begin with Arsh, Surah to Yunus. Somebody mentioned Surah to Ra'd. Somebody mentioned, we forgot Taha. Al Rahmanu ala al Arsh istawa. Surah to Sajda. You know, Allahu ladhi khalaqa samawait wal art wa ma baynahuma fi sitati ayyam thumma istawa ala al Arsh. Ma lakum min dunihi min wali wa la shafin. Fala tatatakkaroon. We mentioned Surah to Ghafir. Al ladhina yahmiluna al Arsh wa man hawla. And Surah to Al Hadid also mentions that. Excellent. We have the Surah Al Haqqa, eight angels carry Allah's Arsh. Surah Al Ghafir, angels are praying and making istighfar for the believers. In a tawbah, the dua at the end of it, Hasbi Allahu la ilaha illahu alayhi tawakkaltu wa huwa rabbul arsh al azim. Who else has a kursi? Prophet Sulaiman. Who else has Arsh? We know that the Queen of Saba. We know that Yusuf also was sat on Arsh with his parents. So human beings have Arsh. Sajda of recitation meshing Arsh is in Surah An Naml, Surah number 27, Ayah number 26. Mm. Sulaiman learned about the Arsh from the Hudhud, the Hupo bird. As we mentioned, Prophet's parents on Arsh, Yusuf, happened to Sulaiman's school, Jin took over it. Um, and Surah's ending with Arsh, Surah Al Tawbah, Surah Al Mu'minun, and Surah Al Zumar, and then Al Zukhruf. Subhana Rabbi Samawat wal Ardi Rabbi Al Arshi Amma Yasifun. And number 14, common statement, Allahu Akbar, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, and la ilaha illallahu wahdahu la sharika lah, lahu al-mulk wa lahu al-ham, wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir. And the seven, just ruler, youth raised in worshipping Allah, one whose heart is attached to the masjid, two people love each other for the sake of Allah, someone who resists temptation directly from the opposite gender, and one who remembers Allah in private. By the way, brothers and sisters, Sisters, you don't have to like each other because you give each other sweet stories. Huh? <laughs> Anybody that contacts you just to tell you the news of the day about other people's business, that is your enemy. That's not a friend to like. Keep that in mind. Wonderful question and answers because this ayah is so powerful. We are going to bring it to the end in a majestic, in a magnificent, and in a, a great way that blows it out of the water. What I'm trying to make us all understand here is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows human beings like to rationalize things because Allah created us. One of the things that human beings have an understanding and try to rationalize is greatness. What is greatness? 
What's a measure of greatness? So I use these images. These are human things. How do you truly measure the greatness of Allah? How do you measure the magnitude of Allah? How do you measure, well, forget about the word measure, we can't, but how do you rationalize the enormity of Allah? The supremacy, the, the, the supremacy of Allah. How do you rationalize the might of Allah, the power of Allah? It is very hard. So Allah ah. is this ayah to give us a way of understanding the infinite. So this is the purpose. The, when you look at Ayatul Kursi, the way it begins, and we're now at the culmination. Follow the ring with us. Let us go clockwise. We start about the oneness of Allah. Allah who? The appellation. He gave himself a name. La ilaha illahu. La ilaha illahu. So he did with the oneness. Ooh. So that deals with origins of Allah. Origin. Allah's persistence, his endurance, his, his yes. ownership, intercession that only comes from him. His omniscience, having all knowledge of past, present, future, and all possibilities. Now we talk about his omnipotence, his highness, and his greatness. So this brings the surah to that culminating point. And now we're taking the part, marked here in red. Yeah. Uh -huh. So this is just, this, this blows it out of the water. Allah wants to now, somebody asked a question. Frame of reference. Um, the frame of reference, reference to what? You mean the, the hadith? You know, I think you were just talking about rationale, about measurements. So I was just saying. Ah, yes. Yeah, okay. Okay, yeah, so we're going to get to that. That's how human beings are. So, for example, let me ask you, since you mentioned Brother Amir, what's, how would you describe the difference between a hill and a mountain? Well, What's you, the difference between a hill and a mountain? Mountain is much bigger than the hill. Ah, so let's see. So there you, you're trying to rationalize the difference by saying size. One of them is size. bigger than the other in size. Very good. Can somebody tell me what's the difference between a lake and an ocean? A saltier one is not. That could be one difference, but that difference is it's not a difference in magnitude. That's a difference in just property. But, oh, I, but you're right there. You, size. Yeah, size it's, too. I mean, lakes are small and oceans are big. Right? Yeah, the water is stagnant. Yes. So, so you see, but you see, we, human beings always try to do comparisons based on size, magnitude, capability, skill set, you name it. Human beings do that. So let's understand two things. Greatness and then omnipotence. Let's start with greatness. So greatness is defined by Merriam-Webster and other dictionaries as is the quality or state of being great in the context of size, skill, achievement, or power. That's how human beings see greatness, by the way. Question, in sports, who is the GOAT in basketball? James. <laughs> This is going to warm you guys up here. Those who follow sports. Who is the GOAT? GOAT stands for greatest of all time. <laughs> Michael Jordan. G -O Say that again. Michael Kobe Bryant. Michael Jordan is regarded currently as the greatest. Yeah, Babe Ruth, like in, in, well, Barry Bonds hit more home runs than Babe Ruth. In football, now they're talking, they say that maybe who's going to be the greatest of all time in football? Brady, you know, so human beings see it this way that greatness is always in the context of a comparison of size, skill, achievement, power. It's, it, you know, it is being remarkable in magnitude and degree, you see, and effective, being superior in quality and character. This is how human beings see greatness, human beings. Allah knows this, by the way. So Allah tries to teach us if you want to have a small understanding of my greatness, Allah says, let me give you an example that will blow you out of the water. Are you ready for Allah's example? That's what this is all about. This is powerful, brothers and sisters. This is the coup de grace in the end of Ayatul Kursi. Keeps me excited. But let's talk about, about omnipotence. When you talk about, we talk about the omnis. You know, in theology, they have the three omnis, omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence. Well, Allah doesn't deal with omnipresence in Islam. We don't believe that, but well, I'll tell you why. But omni there meaning all, universality. Potence means power. So 
omnipotence literally means all powerful having all the power that means you have oh. infinite power you are limitless so this term omnipotence came into the english language in the context of religion by the way because there's no practical use of the word omnipotence you no human being is omnipotent. No machine is omnipotent. You see what I'm saying? It came in like maybe, maybe probably between the 12th and maybe the 14th century there, you know, words coming to the English language in the development of Christianity. So omnipotence, being all powerful, what does that really mean? And being the greatest, what does that mean? That is what Allah wanted us to understand. I think there's a reason why. And this is my opinion, why Allah wants us to understand his greatness without being able to quantify that greatness, without being able to rationalize his greatness, but mm -hmm. to understand that there's greatness beyond greatness. So he wants us to understand the point of reference that goes beyond. Why is that? Brothers and sisters, if you read the entire Quran, Allah never says about himself, Akbar, I am the greatest. Allah doesn't say that in Quran, in the language of Quran. The only places Allah uses the word akbar is to say this aspect of my creation is greater than that. Or to say my jannah is greater than this dunya. And I think because when it comes to Allah, all those things have comparisons. Allah has no comparison. So, it, so we're going to tell you why we say Allahu Akbar. It's beautiful. Let's start with measuring greatness. Look how one of the great ambia understood greatness in the context of size, magnitude, stature, you name it. So this is Ibrahim alayhi salam in Surat Al-An'am. Allah tells us that Ibrahim was trying to debate his people because they were worshiping celestial objects. They worship things. They come out, they look at the star. Like the Romans, they found gods in the constellations. So look at Ibrahim. Before Ibrahim starts this argument, Allah says, Ibrahim So Allah actually showed Ibrahim the universe and was beyond. So that he has certainty. So Ibrahim decided, based on what Allah has shown him, to make a logical argument about greatness to his people. So when night came, People go out at night to pick their gods. You know, the Romans look at the constellation. They say, this is Adromina, this is Perseus, this is blah, blah, blah. Okay, Zeus. Maybe those people did some, maybe they even predated the Romans. So when everybody went out to pick their gods, Ibrahim saw a constellation and says, hi there, Rabbi, I'll, t I'll pick this one. But when it disappeared or when it fades away, I cannot have a god that disappears. When he saw the moon, you know, rise to be prominent at night. See, if you notice, see, in this, in this photo that I use here, it actually shows stars, the moon, and the sun. The moon looks big at night, doesn't it, brothers and sisters? Especially in a full moon. He says, this one is my Lord. But when it, the moon disappears in a few hours from the sky sometimes, he doesn't stay there all night, and then during the daytime, it's gone. And sometimes you can see the moon, but it's not prominent. And when that happened, he says, if my God doesn't guide me, I'm going to be lost. Then Allah says, See, Ibrahim used the term Akbar to say, the, the sun is greater in prominence. It's brighter than the moon. It is also bigger from our view. See, so I want you to understand that human beings understand greatness within the context of size, stature, <laughs> magnitude. You see that? So Allah knows that's how we process. And Ibrahim used that argument to say, I picked the sun. But when the sun set, he says, oh, my people, I have nothing to do with your religions. That's how he led his people to say, listen, you're worshiping things that disappear. They don't last in the sky. Worship the one that created them in the first place. Mm. I just want to yeah. show you how human beings measure greatness. We see it in size. We see it in magnitude. We see it in stature. We see it in excellence and quality. So if that's how the human brain works, the human mind tries to rationalize big things, Allah wants us to now get some understanding of infinite greatness. What you see here is the observable universe 
by scientists. Scientists now have calculated that the age of the universe is 13.77 billion years, meaning from the Big Bang event. We don't know what happened before the Big Bang. Why was there a singularity? We don't know. But we can see the cosmic microwave background. They call it CMB, cosmic mm -hmm. mic. So they see a glow, an afterglow all over. In fact, your radio, some of that static you hear is from that. SubhanAllah, Allah allowed us to see what could have happened before. That's not a problem. The problem is not even a problem. But although the universe is 13.77 billion years old in time, it has expanded rapidly over time. And there's an ayah in Quran where Allah says in Surah al zariyat Allah says, and the heaven, we constructed it with hands. And verily, we are expanding. It's very interesting Allah says that in Quran. You know, the scientist Hubble, you know the Hubble telescope is named after the scientist whose name was Hubble. He looked at the, the fact that objects were not always in the same place after a period of time in the sky. So he was able to calculate that they seem to be a constant, they call the Hubble constant, that they're drifting apart somehow. And nowadays we have more sophisticated telescopes to see that it is drifting and maybe could be accelerating. And the universe is not uniformly uh, symmetric in, in the way it expands. Anyway, the universe is only 13.77 billion years old, but it has expanded so much that do you know what the diameter of the universe is right now based on what we can observe? This is So the image on the left shows the Big Bang and that inflation, cosmic inflation, and that expansion. The image on the right, just try to rationalize that when, they, when scientists look at today now, the universe, you know, we cannot tell the edge of the universe, but as far as we can observe, do you know how wide that is now? Let me give you an example. Let's say two of us, me and one of you, each of us are in the observable edge of the universe. And one of us, me, I have a, a flashlight or a laser pen. And I decided I know exactly where you are, so I shine that light to you. Do you know how long it will take light to travel from one edge of the observable universe to the other edge? Although the universe is only 13.77 billion years old, the universe has expanded so that way now the diameter is almost 93 billion light years in diameter. Meaning light will travel for 93 billion years for it to reach from one end to the other of the observable universe. That is pretty massive to a human brain. Imagine if, no, I'm not saying if you were riding a horse, if you were riding on a lightning horse, it will take you 93 billion years to get to the other side. Allah wants us to understand magnitude of things. That is the observable universe that is called as sama ad dunya, the lowest heaven in creation. Where we live, brothers and sisters, see where the earth is here? That we're in the lowest heaven, that's why we only see stars and galaxies, quarks, quasars. That's why we see all those things. Why is that important? Allah says he didn't create one heaven, not one sama. How many heavens did Allah say he created? How many heavens Seven. did he create? Seven of them. Seven. Suratul Muluk says, Allah says, I created seven heavens, like stacked, layered. So that is why it's hard for us to see beyond this universe because of that cosmic microwave background. We cannot detect anything beyond that point. Imagine if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it stop and we could see something beyond that point. The interesting thing from hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that each heaven is greater as you go higher. So as sama ad dunya this universe is the, the lowest heaven is the smallest one. The one above this one is massively bigger. Imagine this one takes light 93 billion years to pass from one point to another. 
the one beyond that makes this universe look very tiny, like a speck. So this is how Allah wants us to rationalize this all. To his greatness. Take a look at this image I have here on my right hand. This little dot there, let me take this back. This little dot here represents the entire universe shrunk to like a marble. If this is a sama a dunya, there's a second heaven above that, which makes this one dwarf look like a real marble. And then there's a third heaven that makes the second heaven look like a marble. And then the fourth heaven makes the third heaven look like a marble. You get the idea, stacked. Allah says, all these seven heavens, my kursi extends over all of it. My kursi dwarfs all of it. Allahu Akbar. That's why we say Allahu Akbar. You're going to find out even more why. Just picture that. If everything in creation, everything, all the, all, the, all the heavens, all the universes Allah created, all of them, seven. He could have created more. He chose seven. Jannah, Jahannam. All of that is so small compared to his arsh. That's why the Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith, authenticated by Al-Albani, it says, the Prophet ﷺ says, that the seven heavens, as compared to just the footstool, the kursi, it's like taking a ring and you threw it in a desert. Imagine the entire creation as we, we don't know the entire creation, we just know the universe. The next one, the next one, the next one, the next one, all of it together is like just a round thing. Like a frisbee, you threw it in the desert. Bi'ardin falah. You know, barren land that hasn't even no water. Imagine you, you take it in Rubal Khali in Saudi Arabia, the empty quarters. It's like this ring in that empty quarters. That's how the Prophet Sallallahu described it. Let me ask you, brothers and sisters, why do you think the Prophet Sallallahu described it that way? That all of creation is just like a ring in the desert. What, how was he able to make this comparison? Is he an astrom astronomer? Is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam an astronomer, astrologer? Is he? Anybody? Did he study astronomy? Does he know anything about any book? The answer is no. The Prophet no. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is unlettered. No. Then where does he get the authority to make such a, you know, a comparison in the first place? You're getting very warm. Everybody jump on her. She just laid us a foundation because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did what for the Prophet? Sallallahu wa what did he do for him to make him get a realization of this? I'll give you a hint. Clean his heart. <clears throat> You're getting warm. Al Isra al Mi'raj. What happened? Allah made him travel through all the heavens one by one. And he got to look at it all. And Allah made him go to the highest place, as Sidrat al Muntaha. So if he looks back, he sees the entire creation like a ring. You know what happened when he left as Sidrat al Muntaha? He went mm -hmm. to go meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He got to see how small creation was compared to the magnitude of Allah, who he could not see. The companions were so excited. They said, did you see Allah? He said, no, I couldn't see him. There was light all over the place. Imagine seeing the entire creation with your own eyes. Allah said he saw it in Surat and najm One of my, I love that surah so much. You can look at Surat and najm when najm ida hawa. Allah says he saw all the signs. The reason why he makes this analogy that the entire creation is like a ring in a desert because if you keep going up, everything just shrinks to like a little ball. When you leave the earth and you keep going, the earth shrinks like a ball. You pass the sun, the sun shrinks like a ball. Everything looks spherical as you go up. And as you pass them, pass them because Allah says, Tibaqa, layered, all of it looked like a ring. And it became so small. In compared not to Allah, not to the harsh of Allah, but to the footstool of Allah.
the lowest thing that Allah has for himself. The hadith continues to say, not just the kursi. He says, وَفَضْلُ arshi عَلَى kursi." The arsh compared to the kursi is like that desert to the ring. That if you compare the arsh to the kursi, the kursi disappears. It's that small. Mm. Allahu Akbar. Then what about the one that rose above the arsh? Allah says, how great you think I am. When everything I've created, everything living, everything that is space and time, is like a speck. Subhanallah. That's why we say, Subhanallah and Allah. This, this image, I wanted to because visualize it. Imagine, what you see, this image here that I have, this, this oval here, is the seven heavens. And our universe is in the center there. It's like all of that is a little marble compared to a footstool. I just use these images just to give you some type of rationalization. I mean, what does this mean? Allah is saying, the universe is 93 billion light years wide. That's a speck. To the next one, to the next one, to the next one. All of that is a speck compared to my footstool, which is the lowest thing I created for myself. Higher than the footstool is my arsh. And I rose above that. It's amazing, isn't it? He said, my footstool is expansive more than the entire creation. Allah knows we like to rationalize magnitude. We like to rationalize size. Allah says, well, think about that size. That is infinite size. You have no way of understanding it. But at least Allah says, I gave you something you can rationalize. Your own universe, you cannot rationalize the universe outside of it because you can't see it. You have no way of detecting it. Allah Akbar. So Allah says, don't think I don't have power. Don't think I'm just a man sitting on a chair. Like Christians make God being a man. Sits in a chair. It's craziness. May Allah save us from that misguidance. Mm -hmm. We're almost about to Finish this. So Allah says, all the heavens and the earth. And Allah says, for me to protect and guide and, and guard it does not make me tired. It doesn't make me fatigue. It doesn't drain me. I use this image. This is just the image of a human hand and all the planets and all the stars in it. Allah gave us ayat in the Quran to rationalize this a little bit. So the first one is in Surah Fatir. Actually, before Fatih, let's start with Surat Fusilat. Allah said when he created the heavens and the earth, he went through stages. So the six days actually took stages. So the last, so one of the stages Allah mentioned is, Allah says that I finished, I completed the creation of the heavens at seven. Why seven? He picked seven. It could have been eight, nine. He chose seven. In two periods, Allah says, two days. And Allah says, and I, um, I have decreed for each one of these a system. So each one of the universes work in their own specific way. In our universe, we know the most common forces that are in play are gravity, thermodynamics, weak forces, and blah, 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 blah. That's how our universe works. But when you go outside of that, if it's more massive, things work in bigger scales. Look at it. In our universe, if it takes light that long to just pass our universe, then that light cannot traverse the other universe. But guess what? The physics change in another universe. Light may travel faster than what it travels now. That's why Malaika can come from the seven heavens to this earth in a split second. Anywho, Allah says, I have created guards for it. I protected it. I guard it. This is the decree of the Almighty, the one who knows everything. And then in Surah Fatir, Allah says, Allah says, Allah grasps the heavens and the earth so that they don't scatter away. Why would they? Because gravity and all these forces can interact in the in negative way and, and repel each other. 
And if they, if they scatter, how are they going to come back together? Allah says, وَلَا إِنْ زَالَتَا إِنْ أَمْسَكَهُمَا مِنْ أَحَلٍ مِنْ بَعْلٍ if, we, if the universe expands, it accelerates, and so much so that they stretch, all the stars will disappear in the sky. We will never be able to see them because their light will never reach us. Allah says, how will they come back together if I don't bring it back? So you remember, we have the big expansion. Scientists believe we're going to get a big contraction. Maybe that's when the day of judgment comes. Allahu Alam. But they already know it might happen. Scientifically, Allahu Akbar. Allah says, Wala ya So Allah says, I protect the entire creation, but not just the planets, the stars, the galaxies, the different layers. Allah says, You too are part of the protection. Allah protects you. How? In Surah Al Tariq, Allah says, Surah number 86, ayah number 4, In kullu nafsin lamma alayha hafid. I not only protect all the physical objects, even the human beings, each one of them gets protection. For how? Allah tells us in Surah Ar-Rad, ayah number 11, And then Allah says in Surah Al-An'am, Allah says in Surah Al-An'am, Even we have got angels that guard us front, rear, left, right. The job is to do what Allah tells them to do. When your time of death comes, Allah says they pick it like this. They don't even delay. They don't even waste time. Each of us is guarded. The heavens and the earth are guarded. Allah says, guarding all of that is my business. I created it. I know every part of it. I don't let it scatter away. I hold it and I protect it where it is. Allah says, if I don't hold it where it is, scientists actually are baffled. Why does the universe appear linear? We're like on a plane. Because we could not, un we could not explain how come we feel like we're, we're it's like the, the planets are suspended, the sun and the stars. We created the theory of dark matter. We think that dark matter has so much gravity that it's holding those things up but it's a weak interaction with atoms. So that's why we cannot detect it. We're trying to rationalize Allah saying, I hold it up. Allah says, I created the heavens with pillars you don't see. Without pillars that you see, I should say. Allahu Akbar. So Allah says, since this magnificent creation is so massive to human understanding, that says, yet yeah, so, so tiny, but I have to maintain it. That does not do anything to me. Allah ends by saying, Huwa al -ali. He is the highest and al the greatest, the grandest, the most enormous. You name which, whichever superlative of greatness you can put, the supreme, the mighty, you throw it all in there. And this is why Allah uses these type of quality, you know, names and attributes for himself. Let's go from top right bottom to top left bottom. Top right bottom. Let's start with where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. In Surat, um, this is uh, Surat Shura. Lahu ma fi wa ma fil ardi wa huwa al See how Allah uses al ali al to describe himself. Why is Allah Al-Ali and he's also Al-A'la and he's also Muta'al? See those three qualities that mean high. Al-Ali means he's high. Al-A'la means the highest. Muta'al means exalted, so in degree. Allah is istiwa or is harder. So technically, in proximity, he's always higher than everything else. He's also high in his stature. So Allah wants you to understand. All of creation is like a speck of dust to me. Don't think yourself so high and mighty. You are on the lowest part, Allah says. Human beings live in a sama a dunya, the lowest heaven. And then you argue with Allah, you make silly. Oh Allah, if you're able to do this, why not? Next ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Arad, Alim al wa shahadat al-kabirul muta'al. He is al-kabir, 
the grand. Do you know, so when you say kabir, it can be used in many different ways, you know, and again, as we already said, size, stature, magnitude, quality. Kabirul muta'al, Allah is grand and exalted. In other parts of the Quran, Surah number 58, ayah number 21, Allah says, كَتَبْ اللَّهُ لَأَغْلِبَنَّ أَنَا وَرُسُلِي إِنَّ اللَّهَ قَوِيٌّ عَزِيزٌ And this is in Surah Al-Mujadira. Allah says, He is قَوِيٌّ عَزِيزٌ So قَوِي means strength. So that is referring to more like power. And He is Aziz, He's supreme. Sometimes they say Aziz means mighty. But so English cannot capture these words very well. Next ayah, going down. لِلَّهِ مُلْكُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَمَا فِيهِنْ وَهُوَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to him belongs the dominion of the heavens and the earth and everything in between and he has power to do whatever he wants. Al-Qadir. So just listen to this term. Al-Aliyu Al-Azim. Al-Kabiru Al-Muta'al. Al-Qawiyu Al-Aziz. Al-Qadir. And then on the other side we get over today where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says هُوَ اللَّهُ الَّذِي لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوَ الملك القدوس السلام المؤمن المحيمن العزيز الجبار المتكبر. So he's Al Aziz and Al Jabbar. Al Aziz is the supreme. Al Jabbar is the one that subdues. Al Mutakabir is the one that has pride. Because only Allah is the one that deserves pride. That's why Kibriya is a sinful thing in Islam. Then Allah goes down to say, if you go, if you look down like Surah Ibrahim. يَوْمَ تُبَدَّلُ الْأَرْضُ غَيْرَ الْأَرْضِ وَالسَّمَاوَاتِ وَبَرَزُوا لِلَّهِ الْوَاحِدِ الْقَهَّارِ Allah being Al-Qahar, he is irresistible. You cannot resist Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is dominant. وَهُوَ الْقَاهِرُ فَوْقَ عِبَادِهِ Subhanallah. And then he says in Surah Al-Anam, قُلْ هُوَ الْقَادِرُ عَلَىٰ أَنْ يَبْعَثَ عَلَيْكُمْ عَذَابًا مِنْ فَوْقِكُمْ وَمِنْ تَحْتِ أَرْجُلِكُمْ أَوْ لِيَلْبِسَكُمْ شِيَعًا وَيُضِيقَ بَعْضَكُمْ بَأْسَ بَعْضٍ Allah says, He is the one who has all the power to bring punishment upon us from above our heads or beneath our feet. هُوَ الْقَادِرُ And then the last one, إِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الرَّزَّاقُ ذُو الْقُوَّةِ الْمَتِينَ Allah has قُوَّةِ He is الْقُوَّةِ الْمَتِينَ Al-Mateen means that he is persistent. Allah is relentless. He is unyielding. Subhanallah. Look at all these great attributes that just tell you the magnitude of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You cannot understand the one who sits above the throne or rose above the throne rather. Allah says, just remember, all of your creation is tying a little speck to me. And that is why you look at all these names and attributes that convey might power and greatness. Al-Ali, the most high. Al-Azim, the mightiest. Al-Kabir, the greatest. Al-Muta'al, the exalted. Al-Qawi, the one who is powerful. Al-Aziz, the one who is supreme. Al-Jabbar, the one who is compelled. Al-Mutakabir, the one who is proud. Al-Qahar, the one who is irresistible. Al-Qadir, the one who has omnipotence there. Al-Mateen, the relentless. And Malik al-Mulk, I am owner of creation and sovereignty belongs to me Allah says look this is that brings Ayatul Kursi to this point you reach the pinnacle of it so what lives what is beyond the Kursi only someone who's the highest and someone who's greatest in in magnitude greatest in power greatest in forces greatest in capability greatest in everything you can think think of. So this is how Allah wants us to rationalize a little bit his greatness by making us realize our smallness. And that is what should humble us, brothers and sisters. Because of all these 12 and even more, that is why Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar is to encapsulate all of this by saying, you know what? All of this being Allah, makes Allah Akbar. So let us end by saying, when do we invoke the power of Allah, the might and power of Allah? You don't realize it, but we do it all the time for us believers. Take a look at this in your salah. How many times do you say, 
Allahu Akbar. In one rakah, you would say Allahu Akbar a minimum of five times. You'll say, what do you do? What do you say in, 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 in Ruku, by the way, brothers and sisters? When you go to Ruku, what do you say? So yes, so yes, you have so so Subhan Rabbi Al A'la. So, so in Ruku you say Subhan Rabbi Al Azim, and in, in when you go to Sajjah, so so Subhan Rabbi Al A'la. You see how you say Wa Huwa Al Ali Al Azim. Look at this interesting. The Prophet told us that these are the azkar you should make. This is what you should say. So when you make Ruku, you you start Salah Allahu Akbar. Haven't you noticed the first word you use to open Salah is to say Allahu Akbar. You recognize his greatness. You read Al Fatiha, you make some adhkar before, you read Al Fatiha, you read a surah, and then you go, Allahu Akbar, you go to Rukur. When you go to Rukur, you bend like that 90 degree angle. You say, Subhana Rabbi al -Azim. You're on your way to your lowest point. When you go to Sajda, you say, Subhana Rabbi al -A'la. It's very interesting. Look at the reciprocity that it's the opposite where on the human beings lowest point is their face on the floor that's when they declare subhana rabbi al -a allah is the highest i'm the lowest allah is the highest that is why you need to know what you say in salah that's why the prophet sallam taught us in, in 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 a hadith that the lowest point but the closest you are to allah is in sajda ask allah for whatever you want when you're there because that's the moment you recognize you're nothing, you're the lowest, and he's the highest. When you're in Ruku, that's when you recognize Allah is the mightiest, the strongest, the powerful. He made your back bend when you go to Ruku. Look how beautiful it is. Our postures of prayer are recognition of Allah's greatness. And after you finish your salah, you don't realize the things you say. That's what I have in blue there. This is the adhkar from the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What to say after salah? Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam tabarak wa ta'alaita ya dal jalal wa likram. You start to call Allah ijlal, jalla jalalu, ya dal jalal wa likram. And then you say, la ilaha illallah wa ahna wa la sharika la lahu al-mubu wa alhamdu wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadeer. La hawla wa la quwata illa billah. Then you say, subhanallah, 33 times. Alhamdulillah, 33 times. And Allahu Akbar, 33 times. After you finish all of that, you recite ayat al-kursi. So you remember the greatness of Allah if you're a true believer when you make salah. And you also recognize and invoke his power and might when you're changing postures in salah while in ruku and sujood, the adhkar after salah, when you recognize his favors upon you and when you feel defeated, overwhelmed, and or oppressed. The two friends in Suratul Kaf, one that had a garden, what did his believing friend tell his disbelieving friend not to be um, ungrateful to Allah? What did, what did he tell his friend to say when he entered his garden? Brothers and sisters, when you get a new car, say, Masha Allah, la quwata illa billah. You get a new house, Masha Allah, la quwata illa billah. You get a new job, Masha Allah, la quwata illa billah. Clothes, shoes, you, you get a promotion, you name it. Always remember the greatness of Allah and his gifts upon you by saying, Masha Allah, la quwata illa billah. When something bad happens to you, you say, La ilaha illallah, wa ahna wa la sharika lah, lahu al-mulk wa al-hamd, wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir. You know, the Prophet Sallallahu told um, Abu Musa al-Asharid, he said, Ya Abu al-Qais, Ya Abdullah ibn Qais, that's his kunya. Abdullah ibn Qais is Abu Musa al-Asharid. He said, La u'allimuka kalimat, Can, do you want me to inform you kalimat min kunduz al-jannah, from the treasures of jannah? He said, yes, Ya Rasulullah. He said, say, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. If you say that, you will open the treasures of Jannah one day. And that, brothers and sisters, brings us to the end of Ayat al Kursi. That in the end of it, Allah wants you to know that you can never rationalize my greatness. You can't. But I'm going to refer you to one of the lowest things I have created for myself, my Kursi. That kursi is bigger than your entire universe and the universe above it and the universe above it and the universe above it. All of it is like a ring in a desert, small and insignificant.
And when you go to sajda, put your face on the floor. Remember, while you're lowly on the ground, Allah is the highest. Well, Ali, you love him. And he's the greatest in all ways, shape, or form. That's why we say, Allahu Akbar. He's incomparable to anything. The sun is greater than the moon. The Jannah is greater than the dunya. Allah is greater than all things. He has no comparison. With that, I say, Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi. Ya ayuhal ladina amanu sallu alihi wa sallimu taslima. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama sallayta wa sallamta wa barakta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim innaka hamidun majid. Allahumma ahdina fi man hadayt wa aafina fi man aafayt wa tawallana fi man tawallayt wa barik lana fi ma a'atayt wa qina sharra ma qadayt fa innaka taqdi bil haqqi wa la yukdu alayk innahu la yadillu man walayt wa la ya'izzu man a'adayt tabarakta rabbana wa ta'alayt لك الحمد على ما قضيت ولك الشكر على ما أنعمت به وأوليت نستغفرك اللهم ونتوب إليك لا من جاء ولا من جاء منك إلا إليك اللهم إنا نعوذ برضاك من سخطك وببعافاتك من عقوبتك ونعوذ بك منك لا نحسي ثناء عليك أنت كما أثنيت على نفسك ربنا اغفر لنا ذنوبنا وكفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار اللهم جنا من النار وإنا نسألك جنة في الدوس الأعلى وجعلنا من الذين يدخلونها بغير حساب ولا عذاب يا عزيز يا غفار اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزنا علما يا رب العالمين اللهم حبب إلينا الإيمان وزينه في قلوبنا وكره لنا الكفر والفسوك والعصيان وجعلنا من الراشدين فضلا منك ورحمة يا رحم الراحمين اللهم إنا نعوذ بك من البرس والجنون والجذام ومن سيء الأسقام ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة أعين وجعلنا للمتقين إماما اللهم اهدنا واهد بنا ربنا عليك توكلنا وإليك ألبنا وإليك المصير ربنا لا تجعلنا فتنة للذين كفروا واغفر لنا ربنا إنك أنت العزيز الحكيم ربنا اغفر لنا ولإخواننا الذين سبقونا بالإيمان ولا تجعل في قلوبنا غلا للذين آمنوا ربنا إنك رؤوف رحيم سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين وجزاكم الله خيرا بارك الله فيكم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن شاء الله brothers and sisters although this brings us to the um, conclusion of just at al kursi for now we couldn't go any deeper we will continue surat al baqara but before we do we should have a summative exam only on ayat al-kursi and what we've learned about it and all the, how all other ayat connect to it so inshallah i'm going to take some time the next week and a half to prepare the summative and i'll send it out inshallah please do take it you and your family members compete in gaining the reward and the love of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then we'll have a session to review all those questions so that way when you read ayat al-kursi when you leave your house when you go to sleep you know why you read it you know that your life goes in the hands of Allah and he's the only one that has the power to keep you alive or to take it. When you leave your house, he's the only one that can protect you from an accident or any kind of thing. He's the only one that keeps you safe. He's the only one that will keep the corona away from you. He's the only one who's going to protect your children when you're dead and gone. He's the only one that's going to save you from hellfire. He's the only one that will make you cross the bridge. He's the only one that will make your two feet land into Jannah. So when you recite Ayat al-Kursi, you're going to love it as you recite it, inshallah. So with that, 